And we're live with our brother, Deacon Dawit. How are you doing today? Doing well, my brother Deacon Hinoch. I'm doing well. Glory to God. Amen, amen, amen. Would you like to open uh, in prayer for us? Sure, sure. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. O Heavenly King, comfort to the Spirit of Truth. You are in all places, and you fill all things, the treasury of good things, and the giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us, save our souls, good one, with your with the Father and the Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So you were on this program in its last iteration. Here we are in this Paschal season. We've resurrected the Tawahado Bible study. So I want to thank you for uh, being the first guest to have been on both programs. <laughs> so that's an, uh, an accomplishment. Let's, let's start off uh, quite simply. We'll do less biographical detail this time and and maybe just talk about more temporary things like things that have changed since since then which was sometime in uh must have been july 2017 to now wow. so how has the bible pushed you to study in theological school you are a student of theology now but you were before informally now you are so formally mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a perfect definition of it informal in the sense that all christians are in a way study or students of theology, of the knowledge of God, all, um, you know, real Christians or Christians who are trying to become real Christians um, are students of God in an informal way, students of the study of God. And, um, and in a formal sense, when entering a university or, in my case, an online school, um, I would be, I can consider myself a formal student of theology. Um, scripture leading me towards theology is a uh, important part of the path, but it wasn't just scripture that led me to theology. Um, obviously, there were influences uh, across the holy tradition, which includes the uh, scriptures, but there were pastors, meaning preachers, or meaning priests who preached, um, and there were uh, spiritual experiences, like, of course, in the most literal sense, or in the most holy sense, the Kandasi. Uh, which it definitely influenced me to study this. Um, but scripture itself, to answer your question and how it led me to it, um, it would have to be the, the questions that would arise from reading certain verses and the uh, seeking of the answers to those questions. So um, explicitly, how does scripture lead me towards studying theology? Uh, it would be the questions that would arise. And the uh, specifically the question of, the union between all of this scripture, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the letters and all that. What is the union? What do they have in common? Was Is always um, something that makes me curious or that, uh, you know, brings uh, my attention. What do they all have in common? And, um, and you know, gradually I'm coming to learn the answer is it's, it's not rationally uh, um, explained. But spiritually, they all have God and His Spirit as the influencer of the Word. And so I'm coming to realize that more. And so the Bible led me to theology because the Bible is inspired by God Himself. Perfect. Perfect. And I think the great segue is we, we kind of hinted to it. And I think it's because you and I already know the answer. But maybe we chatted about it off camera several times too. But we keep saying it led you somewhere. Where exactly is this online school? What is this online school? Why don't we give a quick shout out to your university? Sure, sure. Um, it's Acts or St. Athanasius and uh, St. Cyril Theological School um, within the Claremont uh, Schools of SoCal or Claremont College, I think it's called. Um, not to be confused with other Claremont schools. Um, and it's a part of the Coptic Orthodox Church's tradition. So a lot of the teachers are Coptic Orthodox, and the school itself is within the jurisdiction of the Bishop of uh, Southern California. Oh, yes, yes, the Metropolitan Serapion. Um, it, yeah, those are two great, you know, Alexandrian fathers, right? St. Cyril and St. Uh, St. Athanasius of Alexandria, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. from whom we get, you know, from Athanasius, we get one of the earliest, if not the earliest, documents in which we hear 
the texts of the New Testament put together and, and canonized. And of course, uh, St. Cyril, from whom we get our name Tawahado from in the first place, from the various Christological controversies, without delving too, many, too much into those, what, what was it that drew you to Acts? I'm sure someone can guess, but you know the kind of idea or spirit behind my questioning is that through these conversations, people could be edified. You know, I have my normal show that is released on Mondays in which I'm solo going through a monologue of the Holy Scriptures. And then I'd like to spend these weekends with practical conversations, almost, almost like a, a 21st century synexarium, if you'll allow me that um, anachronism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so what drew you to Acts? Yeah, great question. Um, and by the way, the Synexarium is something I've just started picking up again after a while off of it. Um, and uh, that's that's a part of it. Um, the story of those saints, St. Athanasius, St. Cyril, um, and the uh, sanctity of the um, the Miaphysite tradition or the Oriental Orthodoxy. Um, so that type of saintliness definitely draws me towards St. Uh, Athanasius and St. Cyril Theological School. But um, there are many other schools. There, are, um, as many of your audience probably knows, there is uh, Holy uh, Cross Greek Orthodox. There's Saint Vladimir's, which were both um, something I had my eye on for a while. But um, in the last, and actually, Saint Vladimir's was the one I was really um, heading towards for a while. And I finally decided on Acts because of some uh, reference or recommendation from a priest in our church. And at the time where I signed, when I signed up, it was uh, summer of 2017, I think it was. Wow. 2017. From what I'm looking at in my registrar, I have not that good of a memory. So I'm looking through my registration forms. It looks like it was summer of 2017. And uh, so the priest recommended it to me. And before then, I had been considering other schools. But at that time, St. Athanasius and St. Cyril's uh, school was just beginning. I think they had been around for less than a year then. And mm -hmm. uh, so it was a, a recommendation, the sanctity of the Miaphysite tradition or the sanctity of orthodoxy expressed in those St. Cyril's terminology as uh, Tawahedo or Miaphysite. Um, so, yeah, and the fact that I could also, uh, you know, study while... Uh, focusing on independent research and independent schoolwork through the online platform that they had, which many of the other schools did not have at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, by the way, there was another Oriental Orthodox Church or school in Australia, which um, I forget the name now, but is a very high contender to uh, Saint Athanasius, and I think they're unifying a lot of ways now. Yeah, uh, I believe Bishop Suriel is behind yeah, that one. Yeah. And I have his, and I really recommend uh, his works too because of his dedication to uh, the the youth movement um, and his uh, book on uh, what was his name Habib Georgis. Um, oh yeah, that that's bookmarked. I haven't gotten to it yeah. yet, but that's definitely on my list. And I got to see him actually uh, preach live. He had gave a homily to Holy Resurrection Church in Culver City here in Los Angeles, where my cousin and uh, a few other people I know, there are parishioners, and of course, Father Cyril Gorgi, the great priest there and pastor, he always remembers me in his prayers. He'll randomly send me Bible verses and and wish me happy birthday on my birthday. And, you know, I'm not even a normal parishioner there. I have a whole nother, you know, parish that I'm a part of, and somehow he still uh, remembers me. He's also got the liturgies or the anaphoras of the Coptic Church on iTunes in English. Yeah, I think you shared that with me once. Those are excellent sources. Um, and you remind me, that's one of the reasons I also continued with that um, school, the location. They are based, you know, at least somewhat in LA or in SoCal. Mm -hmm. And um, I was hoping to, uh, you know, visit the area and possibly even live there, and which I eventually did. So that was another driving force. Yeah, we got we got to spend a year of ministry together, which was beautiful. I think the last time was about a, a half month or less when I was living in Northern California, really Central California, but at least closer to Northern California than Southern California. So, yeah, you, you're in our greater Northern California archdiocese, and then you got to uh, see the many different ways of parish life. So it's like you got to have a a clinic you know oftentimes in university they call it like clinical learning you had mm -hmm. this experiential learning of, of practical ministry 
and, mm. and see what parish councils are like, what priests are like at various parishes mm -hmm. in a fairly large diocese in our diocese of Southern California and Alaska. At the same time, you're, you're learning. And what sticks with me is interesting. You said it's uh, summer 2017. That's the last time we actually had one of these recorded interviews. So it's poetic that uh, three yeah. years later, we're getting back together, not a full three years, but yeah. Roughly three years later, we're getting back together, which yeah. makes me, you know, wonder and think, you know, you've obviously had a lifelong journey with the scriptures and, and all of uh, church tradition, lowercase t and capital T. But what would you say, if if at all, if you if you can, you know, recollect this, are the differences between how you understood scripture prior to Acts and then, you know, during Acts? Maybe we'll have to do another interview after Acts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the differences, although they're probably uh, minute in terms of my perspective, because it hasn't been so long, even though three years is is a while. But you know, in terms of lifelong uh, studenthood or or um, discipleship, it's a very uh, small drop in the ocean. But um, it's it's gradually, uh, I think, forming within me a perspective of uh, of uh, real depth that I hadn't imagined before in terms of the interpretation, interpretational methods that are possible, and allegorical to um, literal in terms of uh, um, story-wise literal, but not you know fundamental literalism, and, and the other methods of uh, interpretation that I hadn't encountered as much before I went to act. I really opened up now, especially in my uh, courses on the Old Testament and New Testament. So, um, yeah, that method of interpretation and or those possibilities of interpretation have really opened up. Um, in addition to that, my understanding of the scriptures as a, um, a, a part of a whole, a part of a whole in terms of understanding of who God is and, and how we should live spiritually has also widened. Um, in, in some situations, I may have uh, assumed that scripture itself was one thing and and uh, and you know church services were another or or whatever the case and as you inferred by the lower case t and capital case t traditions that's something i'm growing even deeper into understanding how it is a part of uh, what makes uh, christianity christianity it is a part of a very deep deep um, faith and uh, that includes how we decided on the canons, for example. It's much deeper than just saying Nicaea decided this when really, you know, from prior to this uh, school, that's probably my, was my assumption, I would say, about the canons of the, the Bible. Um, but in reality, and, and according to my education, it's been a uh, steady progress towards those canons and uh, with a wide array of uh, of differences in terms of what text should be in the canon and what should not be in the canon. So things like that really show me that the importance isn't the word itself, the legalistic word or the legalistic uh, terminology, but the, uh, the interpretation and the orthodoxy of our understanding when those terms arise or when those texts are made available. Yeah, that's right. And of course, um, you know, one of your professors is the uh, wonderful Professor Constantino or Eugenie or Jeannie Constantino. And uh, I learned a, a tremendous amount from her Search the Scripture series. And one of those things that she emphasized a lot was the openness of the Orthodox canon. You know, in Ethiopia, we throw the number 81 around and we have different ways of getting there. Mm -hmm. But really, you know, in the way that you describe it, it's it's more about you know how these things are are received and it's not necessarily all all at once with a a, a waving of a of a magic wand as as maybe some enemies of Christianity like to to paint it to overemphasize the influence of the the kings in right. the in the gathering of it and to de-emphasize you know the church as as institution or as this this place. Or community that chooses to gather in these ways and it was actually i think a couple of years ago i wrote in our epiphany journal the 
way in which how you said the liturgy is connected to the scriptures and that one of the primary acts of the liturgy is the reading aloud or the recitation of scripture because of the vast majority of people in the church who have been illiterate throughout time. Now, obviously in the 21st century, that's changing for the better. But as Isaiah said, it's only better if we're functional. He said, if you have a book in front of you and you know how to read and it's open and you don't read it, how are you different from someone who, <laughs> who doesn't know how to read? Or uh, you know what I'm saying? Like if there's a book and you can't open it or you can't unlock it, or there's a book and you can, whether you read it or not, that's, that's the thing that will make you functional. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I wonder, is there, is there anything like in terms of specific examples that you can paint for us, whether it's about the biblical canon, whether it's in general about the New Testament world, or are there any particular New Testament passages that, that you could read, us, read aloud for us or, or yeah. recite for us and maybe interpret? Sure. Well, um, just to add on to what you're saying about um, whether or not we read it, that's that's very crucial in terms of under, in terms of having a text or having the Bible for us. It's it's not that we just have it there or that we have 81 or 27 New Testament or 26 New Testament books. It's whether or not we also uh, interpret it properly and understand mm -hmm. it properly. And you know that goes to the question about a verse um, when we have from Peter telling us that no scripture from Second Peter, which in many canons from the first century was not included. Um, we have a description of uh, how our interpretation not, must be from the guidance of the Spirit of God or from those who had the Spirit of God, just as those who wrote the Bible had the Spirit of God, the way we interpret it must be through the Spirit of God. Um, so that was the crucial uh, aspect of, of uh, New Testament or of any biblical study that I think I'm really appreciating in this in this uh, experience as a student of theology because um, we have a you know a wide array of stu of teachers of theolo theology even who don't interpret the scriptures uh, as the fathers or as the church does. Um, there are many atheists who are the theologians. Uh, I don't know if it's many or a few, but it's uh it's still surprising so it's not just having the letters or just having the knowledge um, or just having the books there and being read even it's properly with god being interpreted um, as the church has interpreted it not to say it has to be a word for word interpretation of what this saint or what this father said but it must be in accordance or an agreeance with that teaching with the teachings of of the fathers um, and in agreement with the Holy Spirit. That way, um, it, it, in new times and in new generations, it manifests and it, it continues the, the Holy Spirit's uh, um, activity in, in the church throughout generations. And I know you definitely recommended that same towards uh, others and towards myself and how we should have an array or a variety of, of texts that we should read not just from one certain ancient father or just from a modern teacher, but having an array uh, that exemplifies or that uh, manifests the spirit working in the church, the spirit of God. That's right. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm borrowing that, of course, from the language of C.S. Lewis and his introduction to the English translation of um, um, On the Incarnation by Athanasius of Alexandria. So yeah, that's one of his suggestions is to switch off books between different centuries so that you can unveil the biases of, of, each, gen, of each generation or of each century and to make sure, like you said, you are aligned with the spirit of the church from generation to generation. I like how you say that too because I know in, in some popular circles it's a point they don't think too critically about, but some people think, you know, Christianity was good for maybe 30 years, 100 years, 300 years, and then it got corrupt for 1,500 years. And it's like, well, uh, I don't think that's the Holy Spirit if he ceases his activity. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the beautiful things you could do in, in looking back is to see how the hand-me-downs of the trust or the deposit, the family heirloom of the apostolic teaching has reached us and how, how various people have been interpreting the, these scriptures um, over time. Are, are there any other New Testament passages you would like to read for us? Or is there any parting advice or, or wisdom you have for our listeners, 
for how they should approach the Bible. I, I know you've already kind of done it a, already, but especially as someone who's done it for a number of years with with continuity, basically how how they can do it without giving up. Like mm -hmm. how how do you keep your eyes, you know, on the prize? Yeah, I think reverence is very important. Reverence meaning um, attention to the um, greatness of God's work, to the to the wide um, ocean of uh, holy wisdom that's available to everyone and experienced or possible to experience for everyone um, uh, who, who unites themselves with Christ. Meaning uh, in, even in our practical day-to-day -day or uh, our practical week-to-week -week, uh, experiences, for example, in the liturgy, we sometimes um, get so accustomed to the ritual, to the to the uh, customs, we get accustomed to the customs, and we forget the um, the holiness of those customs. And just as we may forget the holiness of the church or the building of the church, we sometimes forget the holiness of knowledge of God or the holiness of the Bible. And just as we revere, for example. Um, in the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, we would revere the, uh, the Holy of Holies and um, bow in front of the curtain that covers the sanctuary um, and bow to, to God in reverence as we enter the church. We um, may not bow entirely physically when we read the Bible, but um, many saints of the past have never sat while the Bible is being read or the Gospels are being read, many have chosen to, to arise from their seat as it's being read to, um, not because of the physical act being the most important, but the spirit of reverence allows us to have that activity or that liveliness uh, growing within us. If we think we've already reached the walls of our underst of understanding of orthodoxy, then um, our natural tendency, or psychologically, we are not going to push any further or grow any further. But uh, those fake walls that we sometimes put up, like even sometimes this is the canon or this is the scriptures only, um, sometimes they just, once we've read from Genesis to Revelations, we sometimes think that's it. Or if we've read it, you know, <laughs> I've heard people say that, unfortunately. and. That, yeah, it's it's a success in a in a way, but it's not um, helpful to our spiritual journey, because um, once or twice or even a hundred times of reading the Bible is not um, by itself def definitive. So no. uh, a verse that really reminds me of that, even though I didn't quote it in preparation, is when Paul speaks of uh, of himself, and it's quoted a lot in Western uh, culture also. But uh, I think it's Philippians, and you'll have to correct me. If, if I'm wrong, he says, you know, not that I have attained already, but I push forward to the knowledge of the upward call in God or, or of God through Christ Jesus. Uh, maybe you can correct that for me in terms of the actual terms there. But Paul himself says that he hasn't fully attained to everything yet. He who has been, you know, a teacher of the church and the one of the most respected apostles says he hasn't attained, but he is a reaching forward and for that knowledge of God and that unity, that holy knowledge that brings unity of God through Christ. But once we Amen. have that reverence, it's, it's really important. And it even even with the, um, like you said, the direct revelation of Jesus Christ that the Apostle Paul has, the place that he has, and in having been responsible for the overwhelming amount of the New Testament, he's still talking about still having attained. He's talking about still being in the process Mm -hmm. He's still having to study. Mm -hmm. I came across a Sunday school teacher one time that made me cry on my inside. And mm -hmm. I was very shocked to hear that uh, they had told me that their students no longer need to hear the Bible because they grew up in Lutheran schools and Catholic schools. And I was very appalled. And I said, how could this be? And I like how you said not just one time, but a hundred times. You know, I, I've probably gone through the Galatians text about 20 times. And here I am on Sundays with our live Bible study group. We're going through Galatians again. I have a lot to learn from Galatians. I've read a couple of Orthodox scholars interpretations on Galatians and still here I am chugging along and I hope that God preserves us and keeps us to always keep chugging to always keep trying to attain for the rest of our days w would you be able to close for us in prayer after giving any final or closing thoughts sure sure um, yeah may God help us to attain to that and make us worthy to attain to that knowledge 
and you know that's a prayer we say even um, in almost all the Orthodox traditions I've witnessed have uh, have that prayer at the end um, uh, make us worthy to attain to the knowledge of the infinite glory uh, of God or of you and um, guided by the saints and guided by the, uh, the angels and guided by the living saints that are here with us now we ask God to uh, make us worthy and help us to continue in that worthiness uh, of his knowledge. So um, let's uh, close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our God, our King, our Savior, Jesus Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us according to your great mercy, according to the abundance of your compassion, blot out our transgressions and guide us so that we may attain to the knowledge of your infinite glory for you are blessed forever with your good father and the holy spirit amen amen thank you for being with us sure thank you